Hi, everybody. I am here with Naomi Alderman, who is author of The Future, the latest read for our New Scientist book club. It's an eco-thriller. It's a techno-thriller, perhaps. It's set in a very near future of this world, and it opens as a billionaire discovers, while he's on a retreat intended to help with his rage issues, the world is ending and he needs to escape ASAP to his survival bunker. Your feedback on our Facebook group for the book club is that you've been loving this novel, and I've tons of questions to ask you, Naomi, so welcome. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Can you start off by telling us about the future? I've called it an eco-techno thriller. It's a bit of a heist novel as well, but how would you describe it? Yes, well, I sort of usually start by saying the novel begins as three billionaires get uh, an alert to say that the world is ending and they've got to go to their survival bunkers to escape. And then it follows what happens to them, which is not what they expect. (laughs) (laughs) And I was, there, that laugh in there. <laughs> was there something in particular that you read or that kind of sparked you off to tell this story? Yeah, so, um, I mean, certainly at the start of 2017, I read uh, a piece in the New Yorker magazine, which is which was about tech, uh, technology billionaires building these bunkers. And um, this just really made me think, God, that's evil. That's really, really evil. And... Uh, I think I wrote a whole book to sort of explain to myself in some ways exactly why it's so bad. One of the major reasons is that if the wealthiest and most powerful people in the world, which arguably those people are, um, now think that they are going to be able to escape from an apocalypse, that means that they have no incentive to try to make it better for the rest of us. I don't know if you've seen in the news lately. I mean, literally, since the book has been published, uh, it's been announced Mark Zuckerberg is building an enormous uh, escape bunker in Hawaii, which he intends to be totally self-sustaining. So, yeah, it's happening. I was going to say, like, given the actions of real-life billionaires, Elon Musk sending Mark Zuckerberg to a cage factory, did you sometimes right. find that reality was stranger than fiction? Yeah, I mean, it is hard to actually write things that are more weird than the things that they are actually doing. Um, and uh, yeah, that's also, that's also a bit terrifying when you realise that the reality is catching up with the fantasy and, and overtaking it. Uh, so yes, I mean, the, the technology bunkers are um, not made up. Uh, these the, the idea that they would be able to escape and that they want to be able to survive whilst the rest of the world burns, I'm afraid, is not just a fun idea for a thriller. Yeah, interesting. Interesting that that's what sparked it off. It's such a different book to your previous novel, The Power, in which um, the power balance shifts when teenage girls develop this ability to shock people, which has won prizes for you. It's recently been on telly, etc. But so that one takes part largely in a world where society, as we know, it has ended, right? Where the event dreaded by your tech billionaires has occurred, kind of bit into the book. Well, it depends what you think. <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, I've actually, I've just been invited to uh, do a lecture for a university on the subject of dystopias. And I think, do I write dystopias? You know, the power is only a dystopia if you're a man. And um, if if the power is a dystopia, then we are already living in a dystopia just for women, which I think a lot of women would now think that we are. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I was being a bit spoilery there in that towards the end of the power, you might say that a, re- a reversion back to uh, 10,000 years ago is a bit of a dystopia. <laughs> Yes, that's true. That that is, yeah. I think I think probably yes. There's a, there's a bit of a nuclear blast potentially towards the end of the book, yeah. which is nobody's favourite thing to happen. Um, and yes, right at the end there, there is a suggestion that some people are going to go into some bunkers and survive it. Um, but yes, in the end, they do rebuild. That 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 I I think that novel is quite optimistic, really. See, that was kind of going to be my next question. So I I felt like the power. I loved it. It's it left me feeling maybe somewhat gloomy, whereas the future, I felt so cheery at the end of it, and I hadn't expected at all to find it so optimistic. I felt kind of warm and fuzzy by the end. Did you always set out to write a cheery novel about the end of the world? Here? I mean, all right, all right, all right. The, 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 the truth is there is a version of it which could still have happened in the book. Am I allowed to do spoilers for this book now? Well, let's just say, spoiler alert uh, for anybody who has not read the whole book. Naomi's going to spoilery now. (laughs) Yeah, anybody who's not read the whole book, um, 
somehow at the end, it does happen that people manage to save the environment rather than completely destroying it, which is what it looks like we're going to do in the real world. Um, and, you know, I've been thinking about this. So uh, the power was, uh, you know, I think um, realistic about the nature of power that it will eventually corrupt and destroy people and that, um, you know, all we can really do is try to stop people from having so much power because once they've got that amount of power, they're going to use it to do bad things. So um, the future... Well, I'll tell you what I really think, okay? Because this is a book club for people who have who have read the whole book. Um, I've, I've done a very specific thing at the end there where it ends at the point with between Martha and Jen where you go, okay, what decision are you going to make? And then it goes forward another 130 or so years. And somehow things have worked out okay in some ways. Uh, in They've worked out okay in the sense that we have not totally degraded the natural world. We've worked; it's worked out okay in the sense that some of these places were preserved. What I haven't done is said over those hundred and thirty years how that happens. So, um, you know, I did want to write something that was optimistic. I think you can be optimistic on a long view, uh, which is, you know, you take a zoom out about our world right now, and you go, do you know what? Still, things are better for women than they were. 350 years ago Mm -hmm. still things are better for lgbtq plus people than they were 150 years ago so when we when we zoom out we can say yeah i can be optimistic and i did want to do that and i did want to suggest that we could get there in the end there are some bits (laughs) because um i think anybody who's read the power will understand what my feelings are about um anybody who ends up with the amount of power that potentially Martha and Jen end up with in in the future is going to experience quite a strong temptation to use that for their own gains. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question is whether long after they're gone, anybody actually cares if they did the main thing, which was to stop us killing all the tigers. Mm-hmm. Mm. So it's a sort of, it's a look from a different angle of how dangerous it is, how dangerous it is for power to be concentrated in any hand. Mm. I guess whether it is teenage girls or tech billionaires or or the saviors of humanity, whoever they may be. Right, right. I think I think we can look at the tech billionaires and go, they have not used that well. <laughs> and somebody else could come in and try and use that a bit better. And maybe that would be a really good thing. And um if there may be some dodgy bits in the middle maybe it would still be a really good thing at the end for them to have done that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I love the way that, um, well, in the power, I guess, society is reshaped in terms of being wiped out by the end or or starting again. Mm -hmm. And in the future, it's it's the little increments that that start to come in that start to to make the changes. Right, and to be fair, I do believe in that. I do believe that a massive revolution is probably not going to be great for anyone who has to live through it. Whereas incrementalism, maybe you can get somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really interesting. I think um, that we all have a bit of an obsession with a fresh start and what it might be like. And I found myself when I was reading the future, desperate to have the world wiped away and to see what might happen next. Is is that something that you wanted to explore, right? The wish to to start over? Yeah, I mean, look, I've I've been writing these... I make I make this a zombie game, and I've been working on that for a dozen years at this point. There is something extremely attractive about a fantasy of a world which is new and where we can start again. And of course, uh, Western people have been attracted by that fantasy of like a land without people where we can go and you know start a new civilization for quite a long time. And it has ended up with us doing some terrible things because if you need a land without people, then you're desperate to be able to say that the people who are there are not really people and so on and so forth Mm -hmm. um but yes i think probably fantasy is a good place for that type of instinct i mean i don't necessarily believe in evolution psychology i think that a lot of it is made up just so stories but i think there's probably something to the idea that uh we evolved walking from place to place and that it's probably quite natural for us to be wanting a regular fresh start and that that would be a normal part of your life if you were 
you know, following the different seasons of the year and the bison are here and the salmon are there and so on. Increasingly also, our social organisation has us more and more stuck and fixed. It is very hard these days to lose an identity and gain a new one. You know, 500 years ago, all you would have to do is walk until there was nobody there who knew you anymore and then you could start again Mm -hmm. and that is not the case any longer and so maybe those fantasies of a fresh start and just what would it be like if we could just start it maybe that becomes more and more and more urgent the less we are allowed to have that in our real lives Mm, interesting and I guess you do explore that a lot with your fox and rabbit idea right Uh, in the in the, in the novel can you explain that a little bit more to us what you were setting out to do with that yeah, so um, Fox is really the hunter-gatherer world that we all come from. We are all descended from hunter-gatherers. There are a few small groups of people still living in the world as hunter-gatherers, and we tend to forget about that. And when we talk about it, we say, oh, you know, this is the distant past. Well, for some people, it still is the present. Uh, and Rabbit is us the settled people who do agriculture, who decided to do this crazy thing that still nobody can tell you why we did that. Because for more than 100 generations, which is a really long time, uh, the the people who are living that rabbit lifestyle, which I called that because, you know, living in burrows and sort of, you know, in that settled place rather than wandering around in the environment. Um, people who are living that settled lifestyle were... Uh, doing much, much worse than people who are hunter-gatherers. So settled agriculturalists, babies died more often, they got more diseases, they had lower uh, lifespans. We can look at their bones and see that they were much more malnourished. Why did they keep doing it? Why did they carry on with that? We don't know the answer. Anybody watching this has as good a chance of working it out because, of course, They left no records. There's no writing. We don't know why they did that. There are a lot of theories, and I go through some of the theories in the book. I think it's it's one of the biggest, weirdest questions about humanity that we have mostly decided to uh, domesticate ourselves. It's as far as we know, we're the only animal on this planet to have ever done that, and it's very unclear why we did it. And the benefits are complex. So, right, at this stage, yes, we have antibiotics and, uh, you know, sterile surgery and we have the ability to do physics and all of these things, which we would not have been able to do if we had been hunter-gatherers. But they can't have known that that was coming. These are sort of side benefits of something else that was going on. Uh, what, What were they doing it for? One theory is that uh, it's called the terror management theory, terror as in fear. So the, the theory is that because we are, unfortunately for us, creatures who are able to understand that there is a future, we wake up every morning terrified. And the normal status of all animals is that an animal throws itself on the bounty of the world every morning. You know, you have your skills, whatever it is, a sharp beak and good eyesight and uh, and very fast snatching claws or whatever it is that that will enable you to go out into the world every day and find something to eat and make some shelter or create a shelter that you can live in for a while. Um, And you don't think to yourself, as far as we know, pigeons don't sit around thinking to themselves but what am I going to eat a year from now they're they're there in the day right Uh, and human beings unfortunately for us can think about the future and so the theory is that this creates such terror in us that we would rather have a field of moldy corn and three very thin sheep so that we can at least look at it and go that's where my meal is coming from than we would to throw ourselves on the bounty of the world around us maybe that's why we did it fascinating but so all of this why did you why did how did it come to you that this would weave together to tell this story of the future oh my god I really had to throw myself somehow on the bounty of this book I just I I knew there were a few different scenes that I knew would be in the book okay which they tell us those right, right I knew from early on that there was a 
character at the end who believed that they were potentially anyway the last person left alive in the world or at least that they had no way of contacting anybody else and that image and some early scenes of that character chatting to to the character's survival suit were in there from really early on and I thought actually at the start that that might be the beginning of the book is this character there and why on earth have they ended up there um I also knew that there was a, a woman fleeing from an assassin in a mall in Singapore. And that, that was also very early on. I knew those things were linked together. And I sort of had to figure out what the bits in the middle were. A bit that came also really early on was uh, Martha skinning the rabbits for Lenk. Yeah. As a non-author, it's so interesting to hear how you start. You have your, you read about the survivalist bunkers, you, you have this... Uh... All of these disparate things and they come together into something that is, is a story. <laughs> yes, there's something about writing a novel that is like setting yourself a PhD question and then just going off to try and write that PhD without anybody being able to tell you whether that's a good PhD question. Because <laughs> the only way you find that is by writing it. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you take any wrong turns on the way then with a bit? Oh, so many. <laughs> God, there was there's at least a 10,000 word section that was um, a sort of fable uh, about some people trying to break into a city. So there was a long fable-like section like that that I just totally threw away. I mean, I'll tell you a secret bit that could, in my mind, this probably still happened, but I didn't put it in. Partly because um, I did think after the pandemic, I didn't want to write a miserable book and nobody wanted to read a miserable book. There is a bit that I wrote which is Martha killing Albert Dabrowski, <laughs> um, which Goodness. is that she ends up... Th- and I think this still might have happened, by the way, because like I say, Martha and Jen have a conversation and then we skip forward 130 years and we don't know what happened with yeah. the infighting between that group. But there is a chunk in which she, that I have, in which she killed him, kills him by using his original suicide note to fake his suicide. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah. 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 So there you go. There's a secret of something Amazing. that is on the cutting room floor that I still might do something with. You had all these disparate bits and you thought, I don't know what I need to bring them together. The Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> in chat room. Actually, the, Sodom was in there quite early on as well. Right. That was, I didn't, I didn't know who was telling that story. But um, because I come from a very religious background and I've read a lot of the Old Testament in Hebrew since I was a small child, the moment that I heard about these billionaires going to their bunkers, I thought of Lot going to his cave. And I thought, do they not know that this does not go well? That is not a good story. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, start, I didn't know when I was writing it to start off with who was telling that story but I thought it was vital to get that story in there of Mm. what happens. I think when people think about Lot, they know about um, the wife that looks back and turns to a pillar of salt, but they don't know any of the other things, including what happens in the horrible cave. Yeah, I didn't at all. And when I I have to admit that when I first started reading those bits, I was a bit like, oh, this is is a bit weird. Is this going to work? Where is she she going with all this? And then I ended up absolutely loving them. I thought they were I thought they were brilliant. It was it was absolutely fascinating. But yeah, it's just it's not it's not the obvious place to go, I suppose. (laughs) No, well, why would we go to the obvious place when we can go to some other interesting places? Yeah. And you even have the pillar of salt in the book. I do. I do have the pillar of salt in the book. Yes, that I think. I I feel like that was an early kind of ah link where I was writing the bit about the woman in being chased by the assassin and then she turned the assassin into a pillar of salt and I went okay it's it's joining up I don't know how but it is joining up going together yeah, yeah. I think my favorite character of all was uh, Marion so I just found yeah. Marius oh, yeah. totally brilliant um tell us a bit more about him and your amazing explanation of machine learning that you that you give oh, him yes So I wrote this section with Jen uh, fleeing from the assassin and then having to hide herself all in one go. And it seemed to me that she would need a friend. And when I started writing the friend that he just came out that way. (laughs) Very fierce. (laughs) 
Yes, yes. I mean, God knows, my dad is an academic and I've grown up around academics. So I'm perfectly aware of the fierce loyalty of academics who know that they are much cleverer than you are. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Marius explains this real thing, uh, which is um, in the early 60s, a, uh, a, a computer scientist, we would now say a computer scientist called uh, Donald Mitchie in Edinburgh, created a machine learning uh, tool which was, it was it, he wanted to prove that a computer as it were could learn and so it's called menace the machine educable noughts and crosses engine and it plays noughts and crosses how does it do it well it, it, i explain in the book in quite a lot of detail how that set of matchboxes and beads can end up playing noughts and crosses i do actually remember getting to a point in the book where I knew that I was going to have to explain this and just feeling some kind of despair, thinking, are my readers going to stick with me whilst I explain this to them? <laughs> because I think it's actually very important in order to understand, you know, it's, it's easy to look at computers and think, oh, they're thinking without having an understanding of what is actually going on. So in the simplest possible terms, how the machine educable noughts and crosses engine works is you have a bunch of matchboxes, each one of which represents a different board state in a game of noughts and crosses. Uh, each of them has little coloured beads in, which represent all of the open squares in that board state. Uh, B O A R D, board state. Uh, and, and you shake the matchbox when you get to that board state, when it's the computer's turn, and then it. it it dulls you out a random bead and that's the that's what you play all right so early on when you're playing knots and crosses like that the machine is going to lose a lot but aha uh -huh, this is the clever bit you know at the end whether the at the end of each game whether the machine has lost that game or won it you know the machine doesn't know and if it has won you go through and put in an extra bead of the color for each color that that it used to do that route to winning and if it's lost, you take out a bead of that colour and you do it again and again and again and again and again and again. And after you've done it about a thousand times, that machine is now very good at playing noughts and crosses. So uh, you start out with some beads and some matchboxes that obviously do not know how to play noughts and crosses. And what happens is you store your understanding of noughts and crosses in the form of those beads and matchboxes. I exp I've explained this to live audiences quite a few times, and, and at the end, everybody just sort of goes, oh, is that all it is? And the answer is, yes, that's all it is. It's very clever. It's a very good tool. All it can do at, at the top of its ability is to be able to reproduce accurately human thinking that has already happened it's not thinking for itself it's not a person sorry and why is this so important to the plot of the novel <laughs> well it's important to the plot of the novel because as, as long as we're still doing spoilers yes. uh, the, the, the thing that claims to predict the future in in the novel actually does not predict the future uh, and the, and it turns out at the end that it never worked. It's also important to the plot of the novel because of this very strange human state where we would apparently somehow, we rabbits, uh -huh, would uh, apparently rather believe in the sayings of an artificial god that we have created than think for ourselves. This is also rabbity thinking. This is the same reason that we would rather have this meagre field and those starving sheep than to just go out and find every day what is available for us in the world. We would also rather have a set of matchboxes and beads that we have taught to reproduce some elements of our own thinking than we would apparently think for ourselves. So those are some interesting psychological quirks of human beings. And they feel worth knowing, particularly in the world now, where people are claiming that artificial intelligence will do all sorts of amazing things. It's a very useful tool for certain things. It's not a person. Don't ask it for advice. Should we all be a bit more fox then? If we can somehow. 
work out how to be a little bit more fox every day. I think that would be good. Also, fundamentally, if we could stop persecuting indigenous people who are still living in a more fox-like way, and if we could understand that that is how we all evolved and that in fact those lives are incredibly satisfying and to uh, support and care for the places that we still have indigenous people living in some of those very traditional ways I think that would be better for all of us Mm. Um, and certainly to seek out the the learning and understanding of indigenous peoples because um Yeah, they know stuff that we have deliberately forgotten in various different ways. And I don't mean that in a woo type way. I just mean about what it means to live good, fulfilling lives. Uh, We are these days living, all of us, in a kind of Fordism, a sort of uh, production line thing where we all do our one job and that's the thing we can do. And we don't do all of the other things that go into making a human life. And I suspect that it makes us much more anxious and much more miserable. Mm. And um, just learning to have a little bit more control over the world around you, whether that be by growing things, sewing things, making things, cooking things, all of those skills that hunter-gatherers would have had to have all of those skills actually do make us feel I think more fulfilled and more happy yeah I can't remember the exact quote but from the poem but something like everything I do I rush through so I can get into the so I can do the next thing that's basically right um right yeah um I'm interested that you started writing in 2017 so way before the pandemic but yet you were still writing a novel about the end of the world. Did the pandemic and writing, I assume, during it affect the book, change the book in any way? Well, this book used to start with 50 pages of pandemic. (laughs) When I was writing it in 2017, or certainly by the time I'd figured out what the book was about, so probably middle of 2018, uh, yes, it used to start with a big pandemic because I thought, well, we haven't had one of those for ages and they're quite exciting. And um, then at the, by the end of 2019, as I was sort of finishing off that draft, I was thinking, oh, this thing that's happening in China, that's very interesting. Maybe I can fold that into the novel somehow. And then uh, by February 2020, I thought, oh, my book is sunk. Sunk without trees. <laughs> um, I can't write this. Real people are dying. Real people are really losing loved ones. And certainly... I don't think anybody would really like to read a book with um, 50 pages of R numbers and, um, you know, masking mandates and so on anymore. Mm. It, it, it has that funny quality, the pandemic, I, of, of being both frightening and boring at the same time. Mm. I never knew that living through an actual apocalypse would feel so boring. Um, so... Yeah, I sort of junk the book and then found a different way through it and mm. uh, started in a different place. Well, at least the teenage girls couldn't get electrical powers, did they? So, right. So far. <laughs> so far. <laughs> what, yeah, so far. Very true. What, what is next? What, what are you going to cause to happen next? Well, currently I'm writing a book about something that has already happened, which is uh, my mother died last year and I'm writing a book which is somehow both about my mother dying and also about... Uh, a strange new animal has appeared in the UK. Okay. That's the book. Okay. I, I will always put together things that don't seem to go together and find ways to make them go together. Yeah, well, they definitely do brilliantly in the future. And thank you so much for coming on and chatting to me. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been so interesting to ask you questions about the brilliant the future. So, um, thank you it's been much. a real pleasure. Thank you so, so much.